Joint Enterprise Significant Contribution Bill. Second reading. Now. Kim Johnson. I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, before I begin, I'd like to pay tribute to the incredible people who have made it possible for us to be here today, challenging the shocking miscarriage of justice that is joint enterprise. I want to start by saying a massive thanks to Jengba families and campaigners, both inside and outside of prison, some of whom are here in the gallery today. Their perseverance and determination has allowed me to present my bill here today. Mm-hmm. Since those early days of the campaign back in 2020, t- sorry, 2010, they have fought fearlessly and tirelessly against some of the most powerful British institutions for truth and justice to get to where we are today. They have never given up on this bill to result. They have never given up, and this bill is a result of their work. I'm so proud to have the privilege of working alongside them and bringing their campaign to Parliament. Yeah. I'd also like to thank the many, many other people who have supported this campaign and helped to raise awareness and support for our demands. My deepest gratitude to Jimmy McGovern, the indomitable screenwriter from my home city of Liverpool, Colin McEwen, the very talented Northern Irish filmmaker, their teams and the whole cast from the film Common, some of whom are in the gallery today. This film accurately depicts the injustice of joint enterprise brought to our screens a decade ago. And a massive thanks to LA Productions for so generously producing a half-hour condensed version for us to show at our event in Parliament this week. And if you've not seen Common, I would urge you to watch. It is more powerful than the Mr Bates first of post office drama, and I understand it's going to be available shortly. I'd also like to pay tribute to the work of Becky Clark and Patrick Williams at Manchester Metropolitan University, who went above and beyond to produce the research on the costs of joint enterprise and of reminding us the importance of not losing sight of the devastating social cost of joint enterprise. Mm -hmm. Their guidance and expertise throughout this process has been invaluable. I want to thank Felicity Gerry, Casey and Professor Matthew Dyson and Nisha Waller from Oxford University as part of a wider working group organised by the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies for drawing up the simple common sense wording for the bill for the illegal support during this campaign. Their commitment to righting this wrong turn in the law has helped to bring this campaign as far as it can possibly go through the courts. And now, together, we have brought it to Parliament, and I hope today will be another step towards righting this massive wrong. I want to thank the many honourable members of Parliament who have previously taken up this campaign and helped us to get to where we are today. Notably, the Honourable Member for Huddersfield and the Honourable Member for Sutton Coalfield. And I'd like to say a special thank you to the Honourable Member for Bootle for his assistance in moving an amendment just this week to the Criminal Justice Bill that mirrors the bill we are discussing today. When I was informed I'd been successful in the Private Members Bill ballot, I can honestly say I was a bit like a frightened bunny rabbit in the headlight. But with the help and um, guidance from the Honourable Member for Castle Point, I am here today feeling confident that I made the right choice in picking joint enterprise as my private member's bill. Thanks also to the Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Newbury, for her constructive dialogue in the run-up to this debate. And finally, I want to thank the Cross... Sorry, Uh, I'm not happy. I thank... Thank you, Madam Deputy. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way, and I congratulate her on her excellent bill to the House and all of the people that she's thanking, the Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, how important their work has been around this bill, and also the fact that the Supreme Court has said that Joint Enterprise has wrongly has been wrongly interpreted by criminal trial judges for the past 30 years. Does my honourable friend agree that this is terrible? 
I, I, uh, I do agree with my own felt, and I come to that point later on in my speech. But again, I wanted to thank the cross-party sponsors to my bill, notably the Right Honourable Member for Bromley and Chislehurst, the esteemed Chair of the Justice Select Committee. Yeah. His support throughout this process has been invaluable and has demonstrated clearly the potential of this bill to create cross-party consensus Wouldn't around a common sense of giveaway. I thank my honourable friend for making such a powerful speech. And just in reference to the honourable member for Bromley and Jizzlehurst, um, this shows that there is cross-party support in mm. looking at how a majority of our young people are wrongly criminalised. Mm. Those young people whose lives are then thrown away, locked behind bars. Yeah. Does she agree that this bill is important and we should take out the criminalisation of young people away from party politics? Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with my honourable uh, member's um, point on um, the criminalisation of our young black people, and we do need cross-party consensus. But lastly, I just wanted to finally thank my A-team, Becky and Charlie, who have been truly amazing. And before I begin my arguments, I want to recognise that this is an incredibly difficult and sensitive topic, mm. because behind each of these joint enterprise cases, there are victims of crime and their families, mm, yeah. many of whom have lost loved ones in situations that most of us would find difficult mm -hmm. to comprehend. Mm. And behind each of these joint enterprise miscarriages of justice, there are people loved ones, whole families whose lives have been torn apart mm. by an unjust lifelong sentence, wrongly punished for the crime of another. I give way. Yeah. I thank my friend for giving way and she's making an excellent contribution about a very important bill. Would she agree with me that many of the young, predominantly young people that are ensnared by joint enterprise often come from inner city black communities, their families are devastated, often lack the uh, media and political connections in order to mount an urgent and rapid legal case or campaign and end up spending several years in prison for an offence they did not commit and their lives are subsequently damaged severely because of that. And this bill is something that is uh, very, very necessary and this uh, injustice has gone on for a very, very long time. Um, um, I'd like to thank my honourable um, friend for his intervention and agree that this bill will look at righting those wrongs and challenging those miscarriages of justice. But it, it is possible. I, can, can, can she confirm whether the leader of her party supports this bill? I can confirm that the party will be looking at this bill yeah, when yeah. in power and when we get rid of um, yeah, when we're in power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to continue, it is possible to both uphold the law by provo providing powers to prosecute those who play a significant role in a crime and to prevent innocent people from going to jail. There is cross-party consensus that things need to change yep. and that it is now up to Parliament mm. to act. That is what this bill seeks to do. No more, no less. Would yeah. your honourable friend I'll give, give to me, just on that point, and would she, would she agree to me, with me that this whole campaign on joint enterprise has not been about getting guilty people getting off? Mm. It's been having a justice system that works for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that the, the, the chair of the uh, uh, select committee and myself uh, are co-chairing the miscarriages of justice group, we believe that this is the biggest injustice yeah. in the criminal justice system, and it's a growing feeling across the criminal justice yeah, yeah. system, including senior judges, that this is absolutely you've got to, the balance has got to be put right. Yeah. Yeah, Would yeah, you yeah. agree with me? I would totally agree with you, and I cover some of those points in my speech. I hope the Minister will listen closely to the arguments I will put forward today and fully consider this opportunity to end this injustice mm. that has destroyed so many lives and places undue burdens on the courts, the prison system and the taxpayer. As the Minister will know, joint enterprise is the centuries-old legal doctrine that was intended to give powers to prosecute people who were not the primary actor in the crime, but nevertheless have played a role. 
for example, a getaway driver in a bank robbery. Mm. But something has gone profoundly wrong yeah. with the way the law has been used for the past 40 years. Yeah. As the Supreme Court recognised in 2016 in the landmark case of Amin Gogi. I thank Honourable Member okay. for giving way, and she's making a very powerful contribution. Does she agree with me that one of the reasons that this bill is needed is because of reports, including from the Centre for Criminal Crime and Justice Studies in 2022, which found that the landmark Supreme Court judgment in 2016, which had expected to see a reduction in these types of prosecutions and convictions, not only found no discernible effect, but also found that the number of black people convicted of murder had actually risen. Mm. And again, my honourable member um, makes a very valid point in terms of the consequences of that landmark case. But as I mentioned, the Jogi case, whose mum is in the gallery today, people are being given mandatory life sentences for murders that mm. they did not commit. Yeah. Thousands have been locked up for the life because they have been deemed, in effect, guilty by association. Yeah. Since then, a very little has changed, with only one successful appeal since the ruling. Mm. And research, as my honourable friend has just pointed out, by the research for um, the Centre for Crime and Justice Sources. Well, 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 I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way, and I would like to compliment her on, on bringing forward this private members' bill. Um, through her good offices, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the families and dis describe some of the cases as egregious injustices yeah. is no understatement. But one of the appalling things I've found is the inconsistent way in which joint enterprise, guilt by association, yeah, exactly. has been applied. Yeah. Yeah. And I, could, could I just point out, there are cases where one might have thought it would have been applied, such as in the case of the murder of Jay Abitan in 1999 uh, and could I just highlight the case for Justice for Jay campaign uh, and they're still fighting for justice 25 years on. Mm -hmm. I, I thank my honourable friend for bringing that point here today and particularly about the Justice for Jay campaign very similar to the state Stephen Lawrence campaign mm. but the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies suggests that the 2016 judgment have little to no effect on the number of joint enterprise charges or convictions. Indeed, since 2016, there is a new legal problem where juries are deliberately not directed to consider the contribution that a person made to a crime, as in the case of Faisal Fiaz, who was parked, who was in a parked car streets away from where the murder he was convicted of occurred. Only Parliament can fix this. Mm. A charge of joint enterprise too often leads to an assumption of guilt in the courtroom, mm. with the defendant having to prove their innocence, turning our justice system on its head. This is a failure of our justice system, mm, yeah. supposedly the best in the world, and an affront to the taxpayer who has left footing the bill for sloppy sentencing. Yeah. Yeah. To quote Jimmy McGovern's common, Joint enterprise might allow it, natural justice does not. Mm. Exactly. If passed, my bill will fix this wrong turn and help to return the law to its original intention. Yeah. Joint enterprise is currently wielded as a blunt instrument mm. by the court, yeah. allowing people who have not made a significant contribution to a murder yeah. to receive a mandatory, mandatory life sentence. Lawyers and campaigners often refer to it as Russian roulette in terms of who is prosecuted mm. or sentenced for life. My bill seeks to enshrine in law that only where a person is proven to have significantly contributed to a crime can they be prosecuted under joint enterprise. This would raise the bar for prosecution and provide the jury with the tools to differentiate between defendants who deserve to face a mandatory life sentence for the role they played in a serious crime and those who do not. There are countless cases where it is clear that we need to change in the law to provide juries with the basic legal test contained in my bill. Give way. Uh, 
Can I compliment the Honourable Lady bringing this bill forward? And I'm very grateful to her because it's enabled me to look at some of the background information in her note that she sent and some of the judgments that the Supreme Court made, which I wouldn't have been aware of. And uh, my, my reason, and I'm very grateful for her pointing out at the start of her speech about the fact that there are victims on the side of this and we have to make sure that we protect them and their feelings and that justice is seen to be done. One of the concerns, perhaps more on this side of the House than that, is that when we hear terms life sentences for serious crimes in the past, they were ended up at five years, seven years, people would be out. Life sentences didn't mean life sentences. And certainly for myself, I wanted to see judges, when they committed a life sentence, make sure it was a life sentence. However, that intent stands directly at odds with the rules on joint enterprise, because I would not want to be in a position of seeing that when that was done for the per that uh, sentence was, was, was down for the person who committed the actual crime, that someone who was there who had not played, in her words, a significant part in the perpetration of that crime was caught up in that. And doesn't she not see that without some of the changes that she's making, the intentions of those of us on our side who want to see those truffer sentences, life sentences meaning life, would fall into some even greater sense of legal jeopardy. And I think, you know, um, honourable friend, um, honourable member, make some valid points, you know, and these mm. issues have been raised by um, the campaign groups, you know, because life has meant life for people um, prosecuted under gent enterprise, 27 years and upwards, you know, um, and usually for a four starting a 14 year old. So this is, you know, the miscarriage that um, we're looking at at the moment. Oh. Again, I want to give some examples. You know, Jordan Cunliffe was 15 years old and awaiting a double eye transplant at the time he was accused of complicity in a joint enterprise murder. Yeah. His mum, Jan, is up in the gallery with us today. Jordan was nearly totally blind and unable to see um, the incident or to run away, despite the confession of two boys who were directly involved in the struggle that led to the death of the victim. The judge charged Jordan along with four others, leading to a life sentence for a crime he did not commit. And when Tommy was sentenced for life for joint enterprise murder, the judge told the courtroom, including his mum, Lisa, who is in the gallery today, that, remarkably, there is no evidence. I can't say you were um, at the scene or you carried a knife. There's no DNA, no eyewitnesses. I don't have a role for you, but I'm going to sentence you on a secondary role and give you an 18-year mandatory wow. sentence. At the time of his conviction, Tommy was 20 years old. Wow. Dean Winston was sentenced to life in 2014 for joint enterprise murder. His mum, B, is also in the gallery today. Dean was 19 when he was sent to prison for 24 and a half years. Despite the confession of his co-defendant, Dean received a longer sentence than the man who admitted and committed the murder. And these are just snapshots of the wrongful joint enterprise convictions from Jengba families who have campaigned for well over a decade to bring to light this grey area of the law. And in their own words, this is a miscarriage of justice on the same scale as the post office horizon scandal. Mm. People are being sent to prison for crime they did not commit. Would my yes. friend give way on that? I thank my yeah. friend for highlighting some of those cases. And one of the other issues with joint enterprise is that we have seen young women and girls criminalised for mm. actions of their boyfriends. Mm. And if we are honest, in some of these cases, and this is an issue that I've campaigned on, a number of these young women and girls are coerced. A number of these young women and girls are being exploited, including sexually exploited by these men. Is this not why we need a change in this, so that we are not destroying those women's lives? This is not just about, sadly, young men, but a number of young women who are being criminalised and, and sentenced for crimes they did not commit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank my honourable um, friend for, for those com um, comments, and I totally agree, and I kind of cover some of that later on in this speech. Except with joint enterprise, it's often children or young people who are being put away for life. Mm. Felicity Gary Casey, who again is in the gallery, has been instrumental in challenging the problems with the way joint enterprise legislation is misused in her role as Lee Counsel on the landmark 2016 Jogi case at the Supreme Court and has helped every step of the way with this bill. She has provided some joint enterprise examples, all based on real cases. 
a boy cycling to and from an incident who has no contact with the victim, a driver who drops friends off to collect drugs and a fight happens outside the car, a passenger in a taxi where others get out of the taxi and go to another area where a stabbing occurs and the passenger has no contact with the victim, school children who gather for a fight and one of them dies but they are all prosecuted even when they have no contact with the victim and have no weapon, mm. children exploited to sell drugs who get caught up in the actions of others, even women looking for her shoes during a violent disorder. So when debating new Clause 16 on joint enterprise at the Crime and Justice Bill Committee on Tuesday, my honourable friend, the member for Birmingham Yardley, raised another case she is aware of where a woman who was a victim of domestic abuse was charged under the crime of joint enterprise and received a longer sentence because she pleaded not guilty mm. than the person who abused her and actually pulled the trigger and killed someone. Mm. And I'm sure the Minister will share my concerns about the way joint enterprise has been used in these cases. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to write to him with details he would find that helpful to follow up. Yeah. And I hope he will come to the same conclusion that I have, that the new law needs to change and we must therefore take the opportunity before us today. Mm. And I believe that the cases that I have referred to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that the current law allows for a far too broad interpretation yes. of complicity yeah. and has that point? I'll give one that point. That one friend for giving way does she agree with me that one of the problems with the law as it currently exists is that it, it persists a system where the fear of being convicted under joint enterprise leads to innocent people pleading guilty exactly to lesser right. crimes mm. and that that's, this is an injustice as well yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, I totally agree, and um, we all saw that playing out in terms of the Post Office Horizon scandal. Mm. But, um, where am I going? Which can, well, I'll, I'll start again. I believe that the cases that I refer to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that the current law allows for a far too broad interpretation of complicity mm. and has enabled joint enterprise to be used as a dragnet for sweeping arrests and prosecutions, which cannot be justified on the basis of natural justice or public safety, and that come at great cost to the taxpayer, placing an undue burden on mm. our overcrowded courts and prisons. Mm. Mm. It, it follows up the point made opposite with regard to sentencing overall. Uh, although this, will, this bill would have a radical effect in terms of the families and the people suffering from this um, legal abuse, basically, actually it is simply a clarification of the law in which a consensus is now built up across the legal system from those practitioners, the concerns that have been expressed in the court, that Parliament is holding them back and securing justice for people, as well as, well, take the Justice Union, it includes the Prison Officers Association and others. There's a consensus built up that there needs to be a relatively minor change in the law mm. to enable the courts to dispense justice in the way that they wish to do. Yes. Yes. This is not a major thing. And I totally agree, and that's what my bill does. It makes a small change to the 1861 bill. But during cross-party discussions with ministers, shadow ministers, and at the Criminal Justice Bill Committee, I have yet to hear a persuasive argument put forward against this formula. And I hope that the minister will agree today that this wording is a common-sense approach that retains the decision-making power with the jury and yeah. merely strengthens the law. Yeah. Um, strengthens the law and restores it to its original intention, yeah. removing those current uncertainties that gives rise to the miscarriages of justice that I have discussed today. And to turn to my next argument, I would like to clarify that this bill will cause no unintended consequences or make it harder to punish people who have committed a crime mm. in line with the law as it is intended. Would, would my mind, on that very point. Would you agree that one of the arguments that we hear time and time again is, are you going to let the getaway driver get away with it? This bill would not do that. And no, there is no intention for that. And this bill that she is introducing is a bill that's fair and balanced 
and I was with a senior retired High Court judge last night who said it's about time we put this right. Yeah. And I welcome um, honourable friend's contribution, and that's exactly what this bill intends to do. So I'd like to clarify that this bill. Now, to illustrate this, I want to turn to the 2010 Victoria Station attack that the minister referenced mm. in Tuesday's debate at the Criminal Justice Bill Committee. In that incident, a group of young men chased and then attacked another young man who was repeatedly stabbed and died. The coroner could not determine who had struck the fatal blow and the whole group of assailants were put on trial and a number were convicted of murder and of manslaughter. And they were clearly making a significant contribution to an awful crime. Mm. Another commonly cited case is that of the racist killers of Stephen Lawrence, Mm. where again, There was damning evidence that the many accused did play an active and intentional role in his murder. My revised bill would allow for their joint enterprise prosecutions. Another recent high-profile case is of the murder of a young woman in Warrington, where both defendants were successfully and correctly prosecuted under joint enterprise. My bill is intentionally drafted to allow the use of joint enterprise laws in such cases to prosecute multiple defendants where there was clearly evidence of a significant contribution by the accused to the death of the victim. It will be for the court to decide in each case what constitutes a significant contribution and it will form a basic legal test alongside many others used by juries to aid in their deliberations and protect against miscarriages of justice while upholding the law as it is intended. But in response to the Joint Enterprise Amendment on Tuesday, the Minister recognised the importance of the law on joint enterprise and the consequences that result from convictions which both she and I find common ground on. However, she ultimately was unable to support the new clause, stating the argument, and I quote, we think it is too difficult to require the prosecution to provide a significant contribution. Following this, I was grateful to meet with the Minister yesterday to discuss the issues raised at Bill Committee regarding the language of significant contribution. She reiterated her concerns that significant contribution could prove too difficult a legal test for the prosecution, in particular in cases where contribution to a crime is difficult to prove and to fight with multiple assailants, where it is impossible to tell who dealt the final blow that caused the death of the victim. And while I recognise her trepidation, I find this a bit disturbing and worrying argument, one that amounts to an admission within our legal system there is an area where we do not believe that it is necessary to prove that a person must have made a significant contribution to a crime before locking them up and throwing away the key. And indeed, that government is content with the state of affairs. It removes the burden from the prosecution to prove guilt and instead places the burden on the defendant to prove innocence. No other area of our law reverses that principle and I hope that the Minister today will clarify the government's position in that area and reconsider. So I am kind of confusing when a 14-year-old stabs and kills a young girl in Liverpool, is charged with murder and sentenced to life to serve a minimum of 13 years, when young men mentioned throughout my speech earlier did not commit a crime and yet have been issued life sentences. Mm. Joint enterprise allows the prosecution to use a racist gang narrative to imply guilt and persuade Mm. juries using prejudicial stereotypes in place of cold, hard evidence. Would my friend go on that point? She'll be aware that the CPS conducted a six-month trial looking at the racial bias bias after legal challenge from campaigners, and the results were stark. In 190 cases, over 680 defendants, they found that it disproportionately impacted um, BME men, um, disproportionately impacted children of the age of 14 to 17, and a whopping 93% of joint enterprise defendants were male. This shows that, again, there is a... law as it's being used now is disproportionately impacting too many young black men. 
I thank my older friend for the intervention, and I will raise that point about the CPS a bit later on. But Human Rights Group's Liberty submitted one such case last year to the Criminal Cases Review Commission after 11 defendants, all black, were collectively convicted and sentenced to a total of 168 wow. years in prison for a single murder. Evidence included a rap video made online a year earlier, photos of some of the defendants using hand signs and the alleged favouring of the colour red. In this and similar cases, the prosecution called police officers as experts to give their opinions on alleged gang culture, a concept which carries with it racist stereotypes intended to sway a jury. I believe that my bill is the right approach. If there is no evidence of a significant contribution to a homicide, then how can it be right that we prosecute for mandatory life sentence? It is precisely this justice gap that systematically drives prosecution and conviction based on interference, stereotypes, gang narratives and criminalisation of culture as a replacement for cold, hard evidence. It will be up to the jury to decide whether someone has made a significant contribution mm -hmm. to a crime yeah. and a person and if a person played a part in a fight in which someone was killed, then the test will clearly be met for significant contribution. So I urge the Minister in his response to consider this carefully and explain to me and the family sitting in the gallery just how we can justify continuing to lock people up when we cannot prove that they made a significant contribution to a crime. It may surprise this House to know that the CPS case management system does not currently enable joint enterprise cases to be flagged. However, they reported on a six-month pilot project in September last year, forced by a legal challenge by Jengba and Liberty. In my meeting yesterday with the Minister and her team, I was very grateful to hear about progress being made by the CPS in this area and that by the end of this month they hope to have systems in place to flag cases of joint enterprise so we will be able to analyse this data. And I was pleased to hear more about the national scrutiny panels. I have written to the DPP to discuss this work further, and I was definitely encouraging to hear that more work is being done in this area and show that it is widely accepted that there is an issue that needs to be challenged, and I believe that Parliament has a key role to play in this. Data from the six-month CPS pilot reveal that over half of those prosecuted under joint enterprise were aged under 25 and black people are 16 times more likely to be prosecuted for homicide or attempted homicide under joint enterprise laws. Young working class and black boys are being sentenced for longer than they have been alive for crimes that they made no significant contribution to. It is truly astounding that nothing has been done about this sooner. It is a stain on our system and must be stopped. On that note, I'm grateful to have received support from the UN Working Group of Experts of People of African Descent, who have raised concerns about the impact of joint enterprise. And I would like to take this opportunity to read out the following statement from them that they sent to support my bill. The Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent confirms that the critical importance of the Joint Enterprise Significant Contribution Bill towards addressing the treadmill of convictions that young people of African descent are disproportionately subjected to in the United Kingdom. The Bill needs to apply retrospectively to re remedy the injustices perpetrated by the law that is directly in conflict with people. It is a testament to the years of campaigning by the families that we have now received this recognition of the injustice of joint enterprise by the UN Working Group, and I truly believe it is a case of when, not if, this legislation will be amended and put right. And I hope the Minister will help today by a, a further step in the right direction. Now, while data is scarce, the full scale of joint enterprise is yet unknown. The pilot study undertaken by the CPS last year indicates that over a thousand people are tied every year for joint enterprise at a time when we have record backlogs in the court and our prisons are dangerously overcrowded. Parliament must take urgent action to end the overzealous application of joint enterprise prosecutions and sentencing. 
So, to conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, a miscarriage of law is a mas- miscarriage of justice, and as I've laid out today, there is cross-party concern and serious questions about yeah. the letter of the law. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. 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 The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Uh, Philip Davis. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I first of all congratulate the Honourable Member for Liverpool Riverside for uh, bringing this matter before the the House. I think she said at the start of her speech, Madam Deputy Speaker, that she was as nervous as a kitten when she uh, came out of the ballot in a high ranking. Uh, Well, I don't think anybody would have uh, recognised that. She brought her case and gave a a very powerful case, uh, and I commend her for that. Um, I, um, I should say from the start, though, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I'm rising to oppose her bill, uh, and, and actually um, I'm, going to, I'm going to make the case that actually in many, in many regards the law on joint enterprise uh, doesn't actually go far enough, um, and I will give some examples as to why that is the case. Um, I, I, I just want to, before I forget, I want to address the point made by my Honourable friend for North East Bedfordshire in an intervention where he said that to those of us who believe that life means life, that uh, the cases that the Honourable Lady uh, mentioned in her speech undermined that case. And I, I, I just wanted to address that because I, I don't think it does at all. I think what, when people say they want life should mean life, I think what they really mean is they want honesty in sentencing. Uh, and the, the sentence handed down by the court is the one that the person should serve. I think that if we went to that honesty in sentencing, it would mean that many of the people that the Honourable Member mentioned in her speech wouldn't actually be given a life sentence. They would be given a fixed tariff that they would be able to serve. And I actually think, therefore, that the honesty in sentencing uh, that I would like to see, and I think from what he was saying, my Honourable Friend for North East Bedfordshire would want to see, uh, it would actually help um, in, in the cases that the Honourable Lady uh, brought because if we had that honesty in sentencing, we wouldn't have these widespread life sentences given out willy nilly, which never in a million years mean life. Uh, now, in terms of the, the, the bill, the bill being presented today wishes to repeal. It's only a small, a short bill, but it has quite wide ranging implications. It wishes to repeal Section 8 of the Accessories and Abettors Act 1861, which defines a secondary party. Now, there are are three types of joint enterprise. Uh, The first led to the creation of the Act in 1861 uh, in response to the case of the Crown versus Swindoll and Osborne in 1846. In this case, there were two cart drivers engaged in a race. One of them ran down and killed a pedestrian. However, However, it was not known which cart and which driver had perpetrated the fatal action. The court took the view that since both had equally encouraged each other in the race, it was irrelevant which of them had actually struck the man as they were both participating in the race and were both held jointly liable for the death. So in effect, where two or more people join in committing a single crime in circumstances where they are, in effect, all joint principles. The case founded the principle that the parties must share a common purpose and make it clear to each other by their actions that they are acting on their common intention. Each individual assumes responsibility for the actions of other members involved in the act. Therefore, a participant in an offence can be convicted even if the prosecution is unable to prove his or her precise role. It suffices that participation itself, whether as a principal offender or as a secondary party, can be proven. And as such, the principle of common purpose was codified in law in 1861 in Section 8 of the Accessories and Abettors Act. Uh, The codified offence reads, Whoever shall aid, abet, counsel or procure the commission shall be liable to be tried, indicted and punished as a principal offender. The next landmark case and second type of joint enterprise cements the joint enterprise doctrine. In 1952, Derek Bentley was convicted for the shooting of a police officer. The actual murder was committed by an accomplice, Christopher Craig. Bentley was convicted after he said the words, and of course it's very famous, let him have it, which formed a key part of the evidence for the case against him. 
as he was deemed by the jury to be encouraging the defendant. Consequently, he was held jointly responsible for the murder. Uh, however, as we all know, uh, this conviction was quashed on appeal. Uh, in effect, this is an example of the, of the, of the uh, principle of where D assists or encourages P to commit a single crime, which is the test used by the Crown Prosecution Service to proceed with a prosecution. Now, as we all know, in order for a jury to find someone guilty of a criminal offence, it must be satisfied so that it is sure that the defendant both committed the crime known as the actus rea and had the requisite state of mind to carry out the crime known as the mens rea. An example is murder. To be convicted of murder, an offender must be shown both to have caused the victim's death and to have either intended to kill or cause really serious harm. Another example is burglary. To be convicted of burglary under Section 9.1 of the Theft Act 1968, the defendant must be found both to have entered a building as a trespasser and at the time intended to commit theft or grievous bodily harm. Joint enterprise relates to secondary liability, meaning that a conviction hinges on the court's determination of what the offender could have reasonably foreseen or anticipated, rather than what was explicitly agreed upon or intended even. So, for example, if two people planned a burglary together, and one, with the full knowledge of the other, took a gun and shot somebody during the course of that burglary, then this would be seen as a joint enterprise, as the person without the gun could be deemed to be able to, re to reasonably foresee that the gun could be used to cause actual bodily harm to a third party. Now, this is where the third type of joint enterprise comes in and is of particular relevance to the bill we're dealing with today. It seems that until the 1980s, there were two strands. The first, referred to as the conduct element, requires that the accessory had encouraged or assisted the principal to commit the offence. The act of assistance or encouragement may be infinitely varied. The second is the mental element, which requires that the accessory had the intention to assist or encourage the commission of the crime in the knowledge of any existing facts necessary for the principal's act to be criminal. If the crime required a particular intent, the accessory must have intended to assist or encourage the principal to act with such intent. And so in 1985, we had the case of the Crown versus Chan Wing Su, which created a specific subset of secondary liability known as parasitical accessory liability. And the Honourable Lady touched on these examples in her speech, and which allowed not only the principal offender and an accessory to be prosecuted for crime A, but also for a second crime, crime B, that the principal offender went on to commit. Here, P and D participate together in one crime, crime A, and in the course of it, P commits a second crime, crime B, which D had foreseen he might commit. This case lowered the burden of proof for the mental element for joint enterprise as a conviction could now be made on the understanding that the defendant only had to foresee the primary offender would intend to commit the second crime. Now, some people argue because of that, the number of innocent victims who did not play a significant part in the offence, as the Honourable Lady said, could have been caught up in this definition. Now, this particularly attracts attention in murder cases where the sentence is a mandatory life sentence, as she said. In the words of the Justice Committee, the mandatory life sentence for those convicted of murder removes much judicial discretion to hand down appropriate sentences to secondary participants who may have played a minor role and may have had no intention that a murder or grievous bodily harm should take place. Uh, Tim Maloney QC and Simon Natas, expert and expert in criminal law, argued uh, for the abandonment of the principle as it can lower the threshold for conviction. In some cases, they suggested that the prosecution over often finds it easier to demonstrate that the defendant foresaw the actions of the principal offender rather than actually proving that the defendant actually intended for serious harm or de death to occur. But it's in its 2007 report on aspects of secondary liability, the Law Commission acknowledged that the principal was severe, although it recommended its retention with certain safeguards. Crucially, secondary liability is a common law doctrine arising from the cases mentioned before. 
According to the evidence given on the 1st of November 2011 to the Justice Committee, the Professor of Criminal Law, Jeremy Horder, from King's College London, a former Law Commissioner, said, the rules on complicity were originally drawn up to accommodate the notion that people have different roles in the commission of an offence, and the rules have evolved over the years. The Law Commission commented in one of its reports on complicity, called Participating in Crime, that at the core of the doctrine of secondary liability is the notion that D can and should be convicted of the offence that P commits, even though D has only aided, abetted, counselled or procured P to commit the offence. The Justice Select Committee report in 2010 highlighted that the offence of joint enterprise plays a large part in getting convictions for offenders who may be involved with aiding, abetting, counselling or procuring uh, offences, um, but um, even though the, because the principal offender does not carry out the act uh, intended. Professor Graham Virgo highlighted the inconsistency in the court's approach to determining the mental state required for a finding of joint enterprise. While some cases only require the secondary participant to foresee the commission of the offence, in others the secondary participate, uh, participant must apparently foresee both the criminal offender's state of mind and the criminal act itself. Now, Before my time on the Justice Select Committee, the committee had an inquiry in 2011 into the common law doctrine of joint enterprise. The inquiry was prompted by concerns expressed to the committee that the complexity and opacity of the doctrine could be the cause of injustice, whether to the victims and their families or to defendants. This report was reviewed by a follow-up short initial report published by the committee in 2014-15. The committee considered the current law and criticism of the doctrine, the use of joint enterprise, its application in cases of murder and gang-related or group violence and whether or not the doctrine should be enshrined in statute. The final recommendation made by the committee was that it, should, that it be enshrined in legislation. The lack of clarity over the common law doctrine on joint enterprise is unacceptable for such an important part of the criminal law. Now, in the, in the, following, uh, in the year following the Justice Committee's follow-up report, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Jogi that the Honourable Lady mentioned, that the courts had taken a wrong turn in pursuing the concept of parasitical accessory liability. That was what the Supreme Court ruled. The Supreme Court handed down their judgment in February 2016 and ruled that the previous interpretation of the law following the Chan Wang Su case was wrong and that there should be no separate form of accessorial liability. The correct example they gave is as follows. D2 should not be liable for offence B unless he intended to assist or encourage D1 to offence B. Whether he did have such an intention or not will be for the jury to decide. The jury might consider D2's foresight to be evidence of such an intent, but foresight would no longer be sufficient in and of itself. The judgment summarised that the unanimous conclusion of the court is that Chan Wing Su and Powell and English did take a wrong turning. The correct rule is that foresight is simply evidence, albeit sometimes strong evidence, of intent to assist or encourage, which is the proper mental element for establishing secondary liability. So effectively, with the Supreme Court's verdict, the common law has already made the bar for prosecution higher again, as the mental element needed is now not only to be able to foresee to prosecute, but rather to foresee a crime as evidence of intent. This bill clearly is being introduced on the basis that despite that judgment, the current common law still sets the bar too low for the prosecution, and in some cases leads to people on the fringes of a group being prosecuted when they're too remote from the murder to be charged with it. Now, this bill seeks to reform part of the definition of joint enterprise and to add in reference to making it a significant contribution. The liability on the basis of joint enterprise will then read, whosoever shall aid, abet, counsel or procure the commission of any indictable offence, whether the same be at common law or by virtue of any act passed or to be passed, shall, by making a significant contribution to its commission, be liable to be tried, indicted and punished as a principal offender. 
Uh, now, the, the Honourable Lady mentioned about the uh, amendment tabled to the Criminal Justice Bill by uh, the, uh, I think it was the Honourable Member for Bootle, I think, who, 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 who did that, uh, which mirrored the measures of her, of her bill, in effect. I, 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 I think, I, she didn't make this clear, I think the amendment was withdrawn during the committee stage, but she, I, she, she, she will no doubt correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about that. Reforming the legal definition of joint enterprise requires careful consideration of various factors, including principles of justice, fairness and effectiveness in deterring criminal behaviour. The addition of the word significant contribution will, of course, be in itself subject to legal uh, interpretation. Uh, I asked her in, her in her speech whether or not the, the leader of her party agreed with her Bill, I, I wasn't entirely clear from her answer whether he did or or didn't. I think she said that he said he would he, he, he would he would look at it. I think was what she what she said. The re the reason I ask, of course, is because uh, as a former director of public prosecutions, uh, he's been invited in the past to give evidence to select committees in this house about the issue of uh, joint uh, enterprise, in which it's fair to say he was quite uh, characteristically. Uh, equivocal uh, about whether he supported it or not. I, I wasn't entirely clear after look, reading through his evidence he gave at previous select committees whether he supported it or not. Uh, although he did go on to say, and I think this is relevant to this particular debate, he did say that it, there needs to be some caution if there is any amendment to it, uh, but one can understand the concerns on either side, is what he said. But when asked at the Select Committee whether he would regard it as a serious limitation on his ability successfully to prosecute culpable people of very serious crimes if we didn't have the current joint enterprise routes to take, he said, yes, I think it would be. So I think we should bear that in mind. Now, the Honourable Lady mentioned the, uh, the BBC drama called Common, directed by the uh, excellent uh, Jimmy McGovern, who is a, a, you know, a tremendous leader in his field. Uh, and, I, and I believe the programme uh, goes on to follow 17-year-old John Joe, who gives a lift to his cousin uh, and his friends, only to find himself implicated in a stabbing, uh, when John Joe sits in the car and doesn't even witness the stabbing, or, uh, nor does he supply the knife. And in fact, he apparently thought he was driving his cousin and friends to get a Pizza. The documentary follows John Joe and the family through the police and court system and shows the devastating impact on the family. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, very powerful, I, uh, I appreciate, as, as, as dra dramas are designed to be. Uh, the drama does also show the life-altering, access-shifting impact that the victim's family go through. Uh, and obviously we should never forget having a family member murdered is absolutely abhorrent. And I know that everyone in this house wouldn't wish that on uh, anyone. So we've got to take a balanced view about all of these matters. Now, I take the view that joint enterprise works reasonably well at the moment. But as I said at the start, I actually think, I would argue, that actually it sometimes fails to get convictions where it should, rather than the other way around. Uh, the, the former director of public prosecutions, Alison Saunders, said in some cases it's not very clear because of the circumstances of the case exactly who did what. But if we know that everyone was participating in the crime, then it helps us to be able to prosecute them and to put those facts before the courts. She said, if you're just standing there, we won't prosecute you. She added when she made that point. Now, looking at the CPS charging decision guidance provides further evidence of the approach to these sorts of crimes. The guidance that the CPS use says where D's role as an accessory is minor or peripheral and the offence in question is a minor offence consider whether it is in the public interest to charge D at all in particular where a court is likely to impose only a nominal penalty on conviction a prosecution will often not be in the public interest where D's role as an accessory is minor or peripheral but the offence is a serious one Consider whether a less serious charge than that charged against the principal is more appropriate. For instance, where the offence attracts a mandatory or automatic or minimum sentence, the charge may be considered disproportionate to the culpability of D. In the vast majority of cases,
there is likely to be an appropriate lesser charge available. However, in the unlikely event that no lesser charge is available, prosecutors must weigh carefully the merits of proceeding with a charge for the serious offence or not proceeding at all. The decision as to where the public interest lies will depend on the facts of each case. It then goes on to talk about the public interest test in more detail. Where there is sufficient evidence to prosecute, prosecutors must go on to consider whether a prosecution is required in the public interest and that that approach applies to all cases involving secondary liability. And so I would make the point to the Honourable Lady that the CPS guidance is pretty robust as it is in actually making sure that people are not prosecuted unduly for crimes where they were only playing barely any role at all. And they certainly shouldn't be, according to the CPS guidance, prosecuted for the same offence as the principal person involved in the crime. So I think actually that covers an awful lot of her concerns. The more serious of the offence, of course, the more likely it is that a prosecution is required. Under paragraph 4.12 B and C of the Code, when deciding the level of seriousness of the offence committed, prosecutors should consider the suspect's culpability and the harm caused to the victim. Prosecutors should take into account views expressed by the victim about the impact the offence has had, and in appropriate cases this may also include the victim's family. The greater the suspect's level of culpability, the more likely it is that a prosecution is required. Now, there are clear cases where the case is too complex and both parties are not innocent, even if there was a party substantially liable. Now, an example of this is the Crown versus Ganango, which involved the unlawful killing of a 26-year-old Polish care worker called Magda. Magda was on her way home from work in New Cross, South East London, when she was shot with a single bullet through the head. Magda was caught in the crossfire between two gunmen in a car park. The two men were in a dispute and went there with the intent of killing each other. Scientific evidence allowed the police to identify the individual that fired the fatal shot. However, I, as the court did, thought that was irrelevant and they should both be considered guilty because they both played their part in her death. Another case with a wholly different situation, which was considered even if only given minimal weighting by the judges in the Crown versus Ganago, but which also applied the doctrine of joint enterprise, was Mansell versus Herbert's case, where in the course of an attack on a house by a group of men, a woman was killed by a stone thrown by one of the group at another person. By a majority, it was decided that all were guilty of murder. Now, the Law Commission recommended retaining the Chan Wing Su principle due to the availability of two defences. The first defence is where a defendant can challenge a joint enterprise charge by demonstrating either a fundamental difference between the agreed upon criminal venture and the committed crime, which I think covers much of what the Honourable Lady was saying. The interpretation of this defence has led to complexity as courts grapple with determining what constitutes a fundamental difference. The second defence relies on the defendant showing clear and unambiguous withdrawal from the venture before the crime was committed, which again I think is a very pertinent point. While the law is less complex about withdrawal, it is deemed overly restrictive. Uh, as Maloney and Natas highlighted the case of Mitchell, where the defendant was convicted of murder despite not participating in a fatal assault due to her continued presence in the vicinity, suggesting her ongoing involvement in the crime. The proposed definition as put forward in this bill will amend the defences applicable and the defendant will now have to prove that his contribution to the offence was not significant. Now, I mentioned earlier, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I would argue we need some changes the other way round to get more convictions in some cases. Uh, maybe Jim and McGovern might want to cover some of these cases in a drama to make the point too. Because as far as I'm concerned, these cases are a travesty of justice. Take the case of Donald Banfield. His wife and daughter were convicted of his 2001 murder. However, their convictions were overturned despite it being accepted by everybody, including the lawyers for both of the accused, and recorded in the judgment of the case that Donald Banfield was murdered, his death was between the 11th and the 16th of May 2001, and he was murdered either by both his wife and daughter together, or by one of them. Th th those facts are not disputed. 
And yet these two women are free to walk around while that poor man is dead. It's outrageous that simply because neither will assist the prosecution with the case and tell them what really happened, there is nothing that can be done to bring one or both of them to justice. Then there was the murder of Kevin Patrick Lavelle in June 2004. I met with the family of Mr Lavelle, who not only have to live with the agony of losing their son, but also face the ongoing suffering as a result of nobody being convicted of his murder. In the Court of Appeal Civil Division in the judgment of 18th of April 2011, Lord Justice Hooper said, on the 24th of June 2004, Mr Lavelle was fatally injured in a fight that took place at the Cricketer's Arms public house in Middleton Road, Banbury, Oxfordshire. He died in the early hours of 25th of June 2004. He was 29 years old. This is what the judge continued to say in his judgment. The cause of his death was aspiration of the contents of the stomach, resulting from two head injuries to the deceased, inflicted by a heavy steel weightlifting bar belonging to the deceased. It was common ground that the deceased died in the course of a fight involving him, Mr Kirk, and some or all of the three respondents. In late March 2009, following a coroner's inquest, a verdict of unlawful killing was entered. It seems very clear to everybody that he was murdered and that he was murdered by one of those people. Yet nobody has been successfully prosecuted for his murder and unless something changes in the law and that the, the law of joint enterprise is stiffened up, uh, this is going to continue to tragically be the case that nobody is brought to justice for that crime. <coughs> and finally for now there's the case of Andrew Jones who the Honourable Lady will know very well who was murdered in her home city of Liverpool. Uh, I also met the family of Mr Jones and they too are devastated by the lack of a conviction in his case. I believe that at the inquest held in 2008, Liverpool coroner Andre Rebello concluded that only one person was responsible for killing Andrew based on the evidence he had heard. Mr Rebello did not name that individual in court. I understand, however, and the Honourable Lady again will be able to correct me if I'm wrong because she'll know far better than me, that her local paper did publicly name the killer and said that if it was not them, they should sue the newspaper. It seems that none of the people who were there on the night are prepared to say who threw the fatal punch, although obviously one of them knows it was them, and it is likely it was witnessed by at least one other or more. And yet this has happened under the current legal joint enterprise framework and paints a very different picture to the one those supporting this bill today have portrayed. When I asked the Crown Prosecution Service about these cases, uh, this was uh, when uh, Alison Saunders was the Director of Public Prosecutions, she replied a, provided a reply explaining the issues involved. She said, turning to the general points that you raise, each of the cases that you have highlighted have raised very different issues and demonstrate that the law regarding participation by a number of individuals raises complex challenges. As you will appreciate, any change to existing legislation remains a matter for Parliament. The principles underpinning the doctrine of joint enterprise have been developed over many years through court cases and in recent legislation such as the Serious Crime Act 2007. I am satisfied that these principles have been correctly applied in these cases. So this isn't a fault of the Crown Prosecution Service, this is a fault of the law. And we, should, we shouldn't forget that this is causing a, a terrible heartache to their families. Also, joint enterprise as it stands acts as a deterrence. If this bill were to be passed, it would also water down the benefit of the current legal position when it comes to the deterrence of crime. Deterrence theory logically suggests individuals refrain from committing crimes when the perceived costs or risks outweigh the potential benefits. In the context of joint enterprise, the threat of being held accountable for the actions of others may deter individuals from participating in those activities where joint enterprise liability could apply. This deterrence mechanism operates on the premise that individuals will prioritise self-preservation and avoid situations where they might be implicated in criminal conduct. And so its very existence serves as a deterrent by increasing the perceived risks associated with criminal 
involvement. The prospect of facing severe legal consequences, including lengthy prison sentences for crimes committed by co-conspirators, can dissuade individuals from engaging in joint criminal enterprises. Furthermore, supporters uh, like me of this will say that joint enterprise fosters, fosters a sense of accountability among group members as they are aware of the possible repercussions of their collective actions. High profile cases where joint enterprise convictions have been upheld, such as those involving gang violence or organised crime, often highlight the punitive outcomes associated with joint enterprise convictions which can act as a deterrent for, further, for potential offenders. And another good example of the benefit of this is epitomising a leaflet produced again in her home city of Liverpool uh, by a wonderful lady called Jean Taylor of an organisation called Families Fighting for Justice, which they give out to children and parents on the subject. Uh, I, I won't use it as a prop, Madam Deputy Speaker, because you'll tell me off for doing so. But in this leaflet that she hands out to school children in Liverpool, um, uh, in schools in Liverpool, she makes it clear the absolute full repercussions of being involved in a crime which could be listed as joint enterprise. And she gives an example. She gives an example of eight young men tried for murder. All were at the scene of the crime. However, the court couldn't tell which one had actually performed the murder. Because of joint enterprise, all eight were found guilty. And the story shows that you personally don't have to commit the crime with a gang or group to be found guilty of the crime. And she puts in bold, this highlights the risk your child takes when being involved in a gang. And I want to commend Jean Taylor and Families Fighting for Justice for all the work that they've done on this issue, not only in terms of joint enterprise, but also in terms of deterring young people in, in her city from getting involved in gangs. And I, I, I will. It, it's making a very uh, complica complex argument. I've been listening to it. Um, there's some very interesting material in it. Um, uh, but some of us, um, uh, he's been speaking for over half an hour, would also like to contribute to this very important debate. And many of us agree with exactly what he's been saying, that there is a great need for radical reform in or joint enterprise. I would have thought he would, could join us, but could he give us some of us, the rest of us, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a chance to contribute to this important debate? Well, well I'm, I'm, I've got to say I'm slightly surprised by the Honourable Gentleman's uh, intervention uh, because the, the, the person proposing the bill spoke for longer than I've been speaking for. And so, and so, and, well, it, well, it's, oh, so we, we, we've invented a new rule, it seems, Mr Deputy Speaker, perhaps I've not known it before, but of course the Honourable Gentleman's been here longer than me, that apparently there's a rule that I was previously unaware of that the person who speaks first in the bill gets to speak for the longest. I didn't know that that was a rule. Uh, it's obviously one that's just been invented. The, the point about this place, and I, I would have thought the Honourable Gentleman had been here long enough to understand this, is that in this place we're supposed to have a debate. And so when the, lady, when the Honourable Lady sets out her position, that means that people who disagree with her are entitled to set out their position, which might differ. Now, I appreciate the Honourable Gentleman only likes to hear arguments with which he agrees, but it's going to be a novel experience for today. He's going to have to force himself to sit through listening to somebody give an opinion with which he disagrees. And I know he doesn't like that, but I'm afraid it's, it's tough. I'll give way to him again. Don't encourage him. Uh, the, the Honourable Gentleman uh, pointed out I've been in the House longer than him. And I've always believed that this, uh, this chamber is a chamber where we have an honest, open debate and a fair debate. Mm. What I'm appealing to him to do is to give other people, like myself and others, a chance to have a short contribution to this debate. debate. Uh, if he has got a, a, another motive not to make an, a, a, a good contribution to the debate, but would like to talk this bill out, that's a different matter. But could he be clear? Uh, is he going to allow some of the rest of us to make a contribution? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm going to allow everybody else to make a contribution uh, to, this, to this debate. But uh, unfortunately, the Honourable Gentleman, through his utterly pointless interventions, has just delayed that matter from happening. But I, I've got absolutely zero intention of talking out the bill. The bill doesn't need to be talked out. It's, it's, as far as I can see, it's so poor, badly flawed that I, I don't think it has any prospects of being passed anyway. So I've got no intention of talking out the bill. And the Honourable Gentleman will have plenty of time, and his colleagues will have plenty of time to make their case as well during the debate. 
I'm simply making the alternative argument against this bill, and I'm taking a similar amount of time uh, to speak out against the bill as the Honourable Lady spent making the case for the bill. And I don't think that anybody could possibly see that as unreasonable, aside from the Honourable Gentleman, who, as I say, doesn't like hearing arguments with which he disagrees. Now, I was talking about, Mr Deputy Speaker, before I was uh, interrupted, about Jean Taylor and families fighting for justice. And the Honourable Gentleman would do well to go and speak to Jean Taylor and families fighting for justice to find out about their horrific experience. I can tell him that Jean Taylor unbelievably lost her sister in 1998, her son in 2000, and her daughter in 2004, all as a result of acts of homicide, uh, including uh, acts of joint enterprise. And she's campaigned for years to fight for victims and reduce crime, and her work on jo joint enterprise, as I've just demonstrated, has been invaluable. And I'm rather sorry that the Honourable Gentleman would rather that the work of Jean Taylor and her personal experience in this would, hadn't been discussed in this debate. But I'm certainly not going to make any apology at all for mentioning the work that she's done, her terrible experience, uh, which I suspect is greater than his own experience in this field. And I think that she has every right to have her views taken into account by, uh, by this place. And so, um, with that, Mr Deputy Speaker, if we could have got here a bit sooner if the Honourable Gentleman hadn't have pointlessly uh, intervened, I don't see the same problems with this, uh, the work of joint enterprise that others do. Uh, I actually think that, as a concept, joint enterprise has been actually very effective in ensuring our streets and communities are safer places than they otherwise would be. I think it's been an effective in making sure that people are brought to account for some despicable crimes who otherwise would not have been brought to account for those despicable crimes. And as I've set out with the number of cases that I made earlier, if anything, the problem with the law on joint enterprise is that it's not working sufficiently enough, it's not drawn tightly enough to make sure that in cases where joint enterprise, in my opinion, should be used by the prosecution service, they're not allowed to use it because it's been so restricted through common law decisions by the Supreme Court and through uh, statute. And so I would urge the government not to agree to any changes to joint enterprise in the way that the Honourable Lady is seeking, but to go away and look at joint enterprise and see how we can actually use it to make sure that it better holds people to account and brings justice to those three families I mentioned earlier who have su suffered a horrendous crime and not had the closure of seeing somebody brought to justice, even though they know, in those cases, who was responsible. I mean, how must that feel to people to know that actually one of those two people or one of those three people were responsible for the death of my family member and still, even with the current law, that person hasn't been able to be brought to account. So I ask the Minister to resist the, uh, the request of the Honourable Lady opposite, uh, but to look at how we can actually tighten the law, because I think that would serve our communities better. So I oppose this bill. Thank you very much. Barry Shearman. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I thank the Honourable Gentleman, who uh, has, uh, made, he has made a, a, a lengthy and uh, constructive debate. I've learned a lot from it. Um, what he has done, I think, is to reaffirm my belief in the fact that this is an area of law that desperately needs looking at, whichever way you approach it. It desperately, at every level, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I've talked to and taken evidence with the uh, all-party group on miscarriages of justice. And I'm delighted to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that my old friend and your old friend, Glyn Maddox, who runs the, uh, the Miscarriages of Justice Group and has played such an important part in this campaign, is in, with us today in the gallery. So, could I make sure that uh, I'm trying to be fair to every member, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm going to make a short speech. I have been campaigning on this uh, for a considerable time because it is we have taken evidence in this uh, uh, joint all party group on miscarriages. Uh, and we have l listened to families, listened to uh, all sides of the argument, and we believe uh, nothing that profound that there's something wrong. There is something wrong with the general tenets of law. 
And as we talk to justices, as we talk to the Commission in Birmingham, as we, everyone we talk to they might have some differences in which way you nudge it, but they know that it's got to be nudged somewhere to give justice in this country to everyone involved. And I'll only wait one point, a tiny bit of a disagreement with my, uh, my, fr my, my good friend and honourable friend, is that we've taken evidence this is, yes, uh, young, young black men actually are more influenced by this injustice of the justice system than, than, than others. But the evidence we had doesn't matter of colour, creed, race, religion, every individual diverse has been affected by this law in, unjustly. And my message today, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this is a good bill. It should go forward because myself and the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman Member for Shipley will be able to continue this dialogue and this debate and get this right. And I'm sure he'd agree with me at the end of the time. The job of this Parliament is to identify things that don't seem to be quite right and then constructively work together to, it, to make it better. That's, there's no devious plan here. There's no ulterior motive. There's a motive to say we believe there is injustice in the system at the moment and we agree with, the, with, with judges, with barristers, with solicitors, with everyone. Let's all get together and change the law. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Mr Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like uh, to start by congratulating the Honourable Lady, the Member for Liverpool Riverside, for bringing forward this bill and raising what I consider to be a legitimate and well-founded concern about joint enterprise. The Honourable Lady explained that joint enterprise is a legal doctrine that applies where persons assist or encourage another to commit a crime, what many people would think of as aiding and abetting, where the offender is known as an accessory. Common law developed by the courts over many years has resulted in that somewhat archaic language of aid and abet shifting to assist or encourage, a simple example being where somebody acts as a lookout or a getaway driver for a burglar. This, in general, is an important aspect of our law, and it's one with which I agree. But the concern expressed by the Honourable Lady is primarily in cases of murder, where one person unlawfully takes the life of another with premeditation. Murder is the most heinous of crimes. Let us be absolutely clear about that. So it is right that those involved in such a despicable act are properly punished. And it is entirely appropriate that the law recognises that a person does not necessarily have to have wielded the, le the lethal weapon or dealt the fatal blow him or herself to have an element of responsibility for an unlawful and premeditated killing. It is not difficult to see that an absolute obligation to identify unequivocally the particular individual in a group who directly and personally caused the death of a victim could, would and indeed has led to no person being convicted. The prospect of two or more people blaming each other in the knowledge that none would be found guilty in the sentence is no figment of the imagination and that would be an appalling failing of the justice system. So the concept of shared responsibility for a serious and offenceless murder is, I believe, an important one in our justice system. The principle of joint enterprise is itself a sound one. However, beyond that starting point is a great deal of nuance. The facts around crimes, even those as horrific as murder, are not always black and white. And for that reason, I believe the member for Liverpool Riverside is right to bring attention to this subject, and I agree with much of what she said in her speech. And I do so partly as a result of my experience in the criminal justice system prior to coming to this place. During the course of many years variously as a magistrate, a member of the Youth Justice Board, non-executive director of what was then Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, and a member of the Sentencing Council, I encountered numerous people either accused or convicted of offences under joint enterprise. Usually that was right, but sometimes it was not, and on occasion it was blatantly wrong. 
Now, as has already been mentioned uh, today during the course of this debate, honourable and right and honourable members will be very familiar with the ability of television drama to highlight miscarriages of justice through ITV's recent excellent series, Mr Bates versus the Post Office. But as we've heard, some 10 years ago, there was a similarly powerful drama in the form of Jimmy McGovern's Common, which was inspired by a real case of a young man sentenced under joint enterprise. It's a powerful piece of television highlighting the difficulty surrounding the legal doctrine of common purpose. And I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for reminding us of that when she showed an abridged version of it at a meeting she held earlier this week with the campaign group that's been widely referred to today, Jengba, uh, here in Parliament. Many members of the group uh, in the gallery today. Uh, numerous of them have relatives who are serving lengthy prison sentences under joint enterprise. And I was grateful um, that she gave me the opportunity to speak briefly at that uh, event to those families. Dr Felicity Gary Casey, the lead barrister in a high-profile appeal case, as we've heard, has set out a number of scenarios where someone could be convicted under joint enterprise despite having limited or no involvement in the crime. Now, the Honourable Lady went through uh, a very full list of that, but I think it's worth mentioning just two or three of them to highlight uh, why there is a legitimate concern here, because although anonymised, these examples are all based on real-life cases, and they include a boy cycling to and from an incident but who had no contact with the victim, autistic children who find it difficult to assess what others will do, children who are exploited to sell drugs who are caught up in the actions of others, and even a woman looking for her shoes during a violent disorder. All these scenarios describe circumstances in which people can be convicted of serious offences despite making no significant contribution themselves to that crime. And it's the question of the degree of involvement that this bill seeks to address. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important to acknowledge that concern over the application of the doctrine of joint enterprise has been recognised. As we've heard, in 2016, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of R versus Jogi that the law on joint enterprise had taken, as it was described, a wrong turn for more than 30 years. The result was that only those who intended to commit or assist a crime, rather than those who might have foreseen it, could be properly convicted. However, research by the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies suggests that the judgment has had little to no effect on joint enterprise charges or convictions, and furthermore, appeals which were anticipated as a result of that judgment have not been allowed. Consequently, in and of itself, the 2016 Supreme Court judgment has not addressed a number of the fundamental concerns about joint enterprise, and that's why I believe the proposal in this bill warrants detailed consideration by the government, even if it cannot, for good reason, accept the bill itself today. The word significant, which the Honourable Lady seeks to introduce, carries a meaning that is widely understood in court and which a judge could adequately describe to a jury. It is not an extremely high threshold. The word proposed by the Honourable Lady is not, for example, substantial. And the concept of a significant contribution will depend on the individual circumstances of the offence. I contend it would be perfectly feasible for lawyers for both prosecution and defence to put arguments to a jury so that the jury, properly instructed by the judge, could determine whether or not there had indeed been a significant contribution to the offence by the defendant. And I would just point out on the use of this word, significant, it features throughout sentencing guidelines which are used by all courts in England and Wales. Indeed, it is used in the sentencing guideline for murder, where considerations judges should take into account consider, for example, whether there has been a significant degree of provocation or a history of significant violence or abuse towards the offender by the victim. Now, I know that in the case of this particular legislation, the government has some concerns over the term significant. Um, they are justifiable concerns. They're ones that need to be fully addressed and considered and thought through. So I hope that the Honourable Lady might consider pausing the progress of her bill today to allow for that full consideration uh, to be undertaken so that we can end up with a situation where we have uh, legislation on uh, joint enterprise that will definitely work in the way that she rightly intends. And I do just want to reiterate that I'm not suggesting the entire concept of joint enterprise is wrong. I agree with the Lord Chancellor, who said last October that abolishing it would mean a lot of people who've helped or encouraged the commission of offences get away, in some cases, with murder. 
but I fear that at present we have not got the balance right. I do acknowledge that the Crown Prosecution Service publishes extensive guidance on its website, which outlines when the Crown would seek to push for a joint enterprise conviction, but clearly it isn't working perfectly. And I would also acknowledge some of the points that were raised by my honourable friend, the member for Shipley. I agree absolutely that deterrence is important, and I join him in praising those who work in their communities to dissuade children in particular from becoming embroiled in crime. He is also right to highlight other miscarriages of justice where people who should have been prosecuted have not been. That is not tenable either. But two wrongs don't make a right, and two injustices do not cancel one another out. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, joint enterprise is, I contend, an important and valuable concept. But I believe that at times, at the moment, its application is undermining that value and carries the risk of diminishing confidence in our justice system. I repeat my congratulations to the Honourable Lady on drawing attention to this topic, and while I accept that the Government may have good reason for not supporting the Bill itself today, I do hope that the Minister will commit to considering very carefully a review of the way that joint enterprise is applied. Dawn Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Aylesbury. Um, we share the same surname, and we also, I also too was a magistrate, and he gave a very informative uh, speech to the House. And I'd like to congratulate my honourable friend um, and support her bill, the member for Liverpool Wavestree. Uh, this private member's bill uh, on joint on enterprise is extremely, extremely important. And my heart in this debate goes out to everybody who's lost. Uh, somebody due to murder, and it's important that um, the law works in this country as it should. The Supreme Court said that joint enterprise has been wrongly interpreted by criminal trial judges for the past 30 years. Yeah. That is a long, long time. And the campaign group, who my honourable friend has been working very closely with, the Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, has been doing a lot of important work around this. And as my honourable friend said, the principle is right. But this is a piece of law that is um, not only open to interpretation, but it is also open to abuse. We know that the, ju the judicial system is riddled with bias, and this law, in many times, in many circumstances, makes it worse. It is nearly four years to the day that I stood in this chamber to raise the case of my constituent, Rashan Davis. His only crime was being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mr Davis served two months in prison, all because of the joint enterprise law, and it has had a devastating effect on him and his family because of that sentence. Some will say that joint enterprise law isn't all bad, and they will be right, and we've heard some of that today. It has led to some high-profile convictions, such as bringing some of the Stephen Lawrence racist murders to justice, and for that we should all be grateful. But it has also seen many innocent people sent to prison for crimes they did not commit. And no one who believes in how the law should work could approve of that. Just imagine, Mr Deputy Speaker, if everyone was found guilty by association. It may be unwise, but it is not illegal to be friends with someone who is a liar or a cheat. <laughs> I mean, if it was, Mr Deputy Speaker, then, you know, there would be plenty of MPs in this place that would be arrested. Um, some, some will be surprised to learn that joint enterprise has been applied to predominantly children and young adults, of whom 57 per cent are from an ethnic minority background. It is not only wrong, but it's lazy and unjustified yeah. to use the law in this way, criminalising a whole group of children and limiting their life chances just because of they may have known somebody from school. Yeah. Those of us who have spent our lives fighting for justice are acutely aware I that the... Oh, give me. I think she's making a very strong point. Does she agree with me that there's a sort of perverse incentive on the police to be quite lazy about investigations of often serious incidents because they know at some point in the future they can deploy the law of joint enterprise and they don't necessarily need to get hard evidence against every single one of the people that may have been in the vicinity of a crime but not participants in it. 
I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. Yes, it's, it's lazy and it, that's also a target driven rather than an informative driven process within the justice system and that is something that needs to change. I mean, the, that, the system uh, penalises and has a disproportionate effect on people of colour. Those with high menelin are judged more harshly because of the colour of their skin. So if you are African Caribbean, you are eight times more likely to get stopped and searched, five times more likely to die in police custody, 16 times more likely to be charged under joint enterprise than their white counterparts. It is absolutely fundamental that our legal system is fair and can be trusted by everyone. It is the cornerstone of our democracy, no matter the background or the colour of one's skin. And as a civil society, we must aim to hold criminals to account. We must invest in good policing, good laws and good judges. It is time, Mr Deputy Speaker, to reconsider the implications and the unintended consequences of joint enterprise and remove the harm that it has done to many innocent people whose families are with us today. And I pledge my support, although I know that the government may have some reservations about some aspects of it, but I hope the government will commit to my honourable friend's mm -hmm. bill and bringing it back into the House so that we can have a system that is fair and right for all. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I will be very brief because uh, clearly there is a mood in the House to take the bill forward. Um, I want to congratulate my friend the member for Riverside on producing this bill and also to take the opportunity to thank many people over many years that have been campaigning on this. Jimmy McGovern has been mentioned and also all of those involved in joint enterprise not guilty by association. I first met them with my friend the member for Hazen Harlington about 10 years ago and uh, we were both members of the Justice Select Committee and were able to persuade the Justice Select Committee to undertake an investigation into the case. And I've never forgotten the power of the evidence that they brought forward of the effect on families. And I've met many of the families affected, including in my own constituency, where young people have been um, ensnared into the criminal justice system because of an incident that took place. Sometimes they knew the people from school, sometimes they happened to be on the same bus, sometimes they happened to be in the vicinity on the street. It didn't mean that they either commissioned or took part in the criminal act that took place and they as a result received a criminal sentence and um, having spent uh, a day as a, again as a member of the Justice Committee listening to young people in Felton uh, describe why they were there and what had happened. It was eye-opening and very instructive of to, uh, as to the um, loss of life opportunities that they had suffered because of um, uh, the use of the joint enterprise law. Well, and I, and I, of course, just, just you know, on that bit, I don't know if he's aware, but I originally got involved in this because of the incident. I chaired the Autism Commission. Yeah. The number of young people on the spectrum that were being involved in these cases. Mm. That's mm. how I got involved. And it is remarkable that there is that link and we should be very, does he agree, we should be very careful of that too. I think my friend makes a very important point and if you look at the makeup of the youth justice um, imprisoned population as well as the adult estate, you'll find a wholly disproportionate number of people that are on the autism spectrum or indeed other spectrums mm -hmm. um, because of their complications of, of life. Mm -hmm. And my friend, the member for Brent was pointing out quite correctly, there's a wholly disproportionate number of young black people mm -hmm. who are taken in to custody and get prison sentences as a result of the law of joint enterprise. I think everyone accepts there is a problem here. And my friend's bill is a way of taking this forward so that we can actually reform the law to ensure that each person that is convicted is convicted because there is evidence against them as an individual and that it is not because of an association they happen to have with somebody who maybe has committed a crime. And um, if you live in an inner city area, you're likely to spend a lot of time with a lot of people, some of whom 
do commit crimes, some of whom are criminals. It doesn't mean everybody else is a criminal. We almost get into a sort of mood of a collective attack on young people because of their association with people that have done bad things. And so I think this bill is an important step forward. Now, I understand what the member for Aylesbury was saying. It was a very interesting and very important contribution that he made, that there has to be some clarification of the law here. And uh, I understand when the minister speaks, they're going to express some reservations this bill. I hope, however, the government will encourage the bill to go forward today so that they can go into discussion with my friend on the way we can take this thing forward. Because this is a parliamentary opportunity yes. to right a wrong. Mm. That's what we're here for. That's what Friday debates are all, all about. It's also to come and listen to the member for Shipley, and I'm grateful for his 30-minute <laughs> speech. Uh, sometimes they're longer. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's been an, a very effective debate, and I hope the Minister will understand that those of us that support this bill do so from a very genuine concern to ensure there is pr a proper and effective system of justice that people can have confidence in. In an intervention on my friend from Brent, I made the point about it's too easy to get prosecutions by using the joint enterprise law. It should never be easy to get a prosecution. It should be effective to yeah. get a prosecution for somebody that, uh, against somebody that has committed well, a crime. Right, of, course. of course. On that point, in terms of prosecutions, um, a few weeks ago spoke on a debate on knife crime, and I think one of the issues we've all raised in this House are issues that our constituents have brought with us in terms of getting those prosecutions yeah. before the courts. So again, it does beg a belief that we've got victims who are grieving, victims who've lost close family members, trying to get their cases before the court, but yet we are seeing people convicted just because of where they are, the music they've listened to, who their boyfriends were, or who mm. they knew. Mm. This is totally unacceptable. Yeah. My friend makes a very good and very powerful point, and like her, I represent a constituency where, sadly, we do experience knife crime, we do experience death by knife crime, and I always visit the families that are victims of knife crime, and it is a horrific experience trying to share the pain with them. We've all, I think, been through this particular experience. So I do ask the Minister, when he responds to this debate, to recognise the importance of the issue, recognise the burden of the argument that has been put forward by those of us that strongly support this bill, and hope that he would be prepared to have discussions with my friend and the promoters of this bill to see if it's necessary to bring any amendments in committee to bring them. But what I don't want to hear is warm words that at some point, some indeterminate point in the indefinite future, there will be a proposal coming forward which will deal with what we all acknowledge to be a wrong. We've been down too many cul-de-sacs before on this. This is an opportunity. Let's take the opportunity to right a wrong in our criminal justice system. Shadow Minister Janet David. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the member for Liverpool Riverside, uh, on her success in the private member's bill ballot, and I'm pleased to be responding to the second reading of the bill today. It's important that this issue has been brought to the attention of the House. Children and justice is an area of concern for many when joint enterprise is considered, and this area has been campaigned on for several years. The bill today highlights this, and I'm also aware that an amendment similar to this bill was tabled to the Criminal <laughs> Justice Bill. Before I go further into the discussion of this bill, it is right to say that although the bill is critical of the joint enterprise, there are very convincing arguments for amendments to this. Joint enterprise is also a necessary tool in the criminal justice system, and I'll explain this further later in this debate. I would also like to thank all members who have taken part and contributed in this debate. My honourable friend for Vauxhall, Brent Central, Huddersfield, Popular and Limehouse, Hayes and Harlington, uh, Birkenhead and Easington. The honourable member for Ellsbury, Islington, North East Bedfordshire. I have also noted the many comments made by the honourable member for Shipley. And I've listened overall to the comments, and it is a very clear message coming through from the debate uh, this uh, afternoon that joint enterprise needs to be reviewed. As we, as we have heard, joint enterprise allows an individual to be jointly convicted of the crime of another if the court finds that they are involved in the commission of the crime. 
There is a strong case to tighten the definition currently used to ensure that justice is fair and proportionate. As in the case of R versus uh, Joggy in 2016, the Supreme Court ruled that joint enterprise had been wrongly used for 30 years, and this is extremely concerning. The ruling stated that it was not enough for the prosecution to prove that the defendant foresaw the possibility of the violence occurring. Instead, the prosecution should now prove that the defendant intended to encourage or assist the person who committed the crime. Yet there is a list of controversial joint enterprise cases that continue to this day. The Manchester 10 case, which many in this chamber will know, was tried under conspiracy legislation, but activists say this mirrors crimes prosecuted in the UK as joint enterprise. During this trial, the use of drill music to convict the 10 defendants had also been criticised, which is a common feature of joint enterprise prosecutions for defendants from minority backgrounds. I am aware of the campaign by Art Not Evidence that aims to stop the criminalisation of those who engage in rap and drill music. No, I've also... Happy to give way. Thank you. I thank my honourable member for giving way. Just on that point, does my honourable member... Does my honourable friend agree with me that it is important that we, we do not judge people by the music that they listen to? Mm. It's a very subjective measure of judging one music to be violent and, and against yeah. another music exactly. uh, uh, genre of music to be violent. Does my honourable friend agree with me? Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree with my um, honourable friend. Um, she is uh, making a very meaningful point. You know, there is lots of words and lots of different types of music, and we should not be uh, judged by that. Um, I've also met with Janet uh, Cuncliffe, a co-founder of Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, as we've already heard, known as Jengba, whose son was imprisoned under Joint Enterprise. She is a tireless campaigner who has shared in the experience of her son's sentence. And in 2020, Jengba released research report written by academics at Manchester Metropolitan University arguing that women are negatively impacted by joint enterprise. It stated that often women are marginalised to the event with almost half not present at the scene and almost all never having engaged in any physical violence, yet they are seriously penalised. Jengba highlighted the case of a teenager, Carrie. She was 15 years old, and in the early hours, she was walking with two older people. They had all been drinking. A fight broke out with another group of local adults. One person from the other group was killed by an injury caused by a broken bottle. In summing up of the case, the judge acknowledged that Carrie was so drunk she did not have the ability to join in with the fight. The judge warned that mere presence is not enough. There must be some form of participation. During the trial, judgments were made about Carrie's character and not her actions. This became central to the prosecution. The offence was committed by a 35-year-old man. The jury found the man guilty of murder, and Carrie, 15 years old at the time of the event, was found guilty of manslaughter. The report found that there are many other women like Carrie in prison. Now, I've been critical of joint enterprise, but there is a place for joint enterprise in our courts and the wider criminal justice system. Joint enterprise has helped to secure convictions that otherwise would have not have been successful. The conviction of some of the men who killed Stephen Lawrence was secured using joint enterprise legislation. By using joint enterprise legislation, it was found that it did not matter whether Gary Dobson and David Norris carried out the killings, rather it was important they were part of an attack that could end in serious harm, and indeed it did. It has also been successfully used to prosecute paedophile rings and those who commit economic crime. This should not be forgotten, and I'm glad that this bill does not seek to abolish joint enterprise in its entirety. Labour has previously said it would look to reform joint enterprise, and that remains our ambition. Furthermore, the Lama Review of 2017 advocated for the reform of the joint enterprise laws. In particular, Recommendation 16 argued the Crown Prosecution Service should take the opportunity while it reworks its guidance on joint enterprise to consider its approach to gang prosecutions in general. With regards to Recommendation 6, the CPS commenced a pilot to monitor joint enterprise homicide and attempted homicide cases in February 2023. 
The results were very concerning. Black people make up only 4% of the UK population, but according to the CPS under joint enterprise cases, black defendants make up 30% of caseloads. It also revealed that joint enterprise prosecutions disproportionately affect children, young people and men. There are very few progress on more data gathering with the commencement of a full national scheme in all CPS areas. The CPS has said a report of homicide and attempted homicide cases brought on a joint enterprise basis will be broken down by the protected characteristics of ethnicity, sex, age and disability, and this will be produced annually. I believe that the CPS has today convened a scrutiny panel with a focus on joint enterprise cases where evidence of gang association is a feature. Let me be clear. The bill is perfectly reasonable and commendable. However, to get the best chance of proper reform, it's important to wait until the CPS has built up more data before legislation is used to tackle the problem. Only by knowing the full picture will we be able to solve the issue at hand so that the law works as it is intended. Many from across the political spectrum believe that change needs to happen. There are some cases where people have been convicted of serious crimes despite making no significant contribution, and we have already heard some of those examples from across the chamber. It is not in the public interest to prosecute those who have not made a significant contribution to a crime. I'd be interested to know if the Minister agrees. When we applying to an amendment on joint enterprise in the Criminal Justice Bill, the Government said there have been examples of case law since the Joggy case that show that the approach has been fairly applied. However, I'd like to know the Minister's view. Are the reported disproportionate impacts that joint enterprise has on diverse communities. The government must end the criminalisation of children and young people associated with rap and drill music I'll just, make, I'll just end this. and put in protective factors to ensure children and the young people are not disproportionately criminalised under joint enterprise. You just got in there. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what her and her honourable friends, what the point they're making is when they talk about the disproportionate amount of uh, of people from various ethnic minorities who were who have been prosecuted under joint enterprise. Is, is she saying that the Crown Prosecution Service is institutionally racist? Is she saying that juries are institutionally racist? Is, what, what, what is the point she's making about it? Is that the allegation that she's making from the Labour front bench? Um, the intervention was very interesting. I find it very concerning and alarming that um, in this place that it appears to me that honourable members are not aware of how racism, racism and discrimination acts. And I find that concerning because uh, there's been so much evidence and information and reports and inquiries and review that has come out of uh, this place and many other institutional and public organisations across our country for many years. And for the member to question whether in the way that um, he has I find really alarming and disturbing. I look forward to the Minister's responses to uh, my uh, speech. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the member for Liverpool Riverside for introducing uh, this bill. I know it's an area of significant interest to her and indeed to other members of the House. But I would also like to state at the outset that the Government is unable to support the Bill in its current form, uh, and I'll explain our reasons for that later in my speech. But let me begin by saying that the Government understands and recognises the importance of the law of joint enterprise and the consequences that result from convictions for such crimes. We recognise that this can be extremely difficult for defendants and their families to accept, but equally, the impact of any crime is devastating for the victim and their family particularly where the crime is one of murder. For any government, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a need to ensure that any perpetrator who commits a crime or aids, abets, encourages or assists in one is brought to justice. Victims and their family especially have an expectation that all those involved in that crime, particularly one as serious as murder, are prosecuted. Now, we've had some powerful speeches from both sides of the House today, sincere speeches indeed. And I would like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member 
for Liverpool Riverside, but in addition to her, my honourable friend, the member for Shipley, the honourable gentleman, the member for Huddersfield, my honourable friend, the member for Aylesbury, the honourable lady, the member for Brent, Brent Central, the right honourable gentleman, the member for Islington North, and the honourable lady, uh, the member for Lewisham East. I would also like, if I may, and for the benefit of the House, to give some further explanation as to the law on joint enterprise and how it works in practice, and then I will outline why the government is not supportive of the bill today. Now, we've all read the headlines about joint enterprise cases. The individuals who were charged and convicted of crimes that they state they did not commit or were not there when the crime occurred. But more often than not, these headlines reduce a few sentences of what are extremely complex cases where there's a significant body of detailed evidence which needs to be considered in detail in order to truly understand what happened. And that job is rightly the job of the independent courts. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, as has been mentioned by many honourable and right honourable members today, joint enterprise is a complex area of law. It's a common law doctrine that can be applied to most offences and generally applies where a person assists or encourages another to commit a crime. The principles that apply to joint enterprise cases remain the same. Wherever the offence, whatever the offence, uh, they are applied to and apply equally to a pre-planned or spontaneous act of joint enterprise. Where two or more individuals are involved in committing a crime, the parties to the offence may be classed as principals or secondary parties. Each offence will have at least one principal, although it's not always possible to, or necessary to identify who the principals are. A principal is a person who is the actual perpetrator of the substantive offence, and a secondary party is one who aids, abets, counsels or <coughs> procures, more commonly known as assists or encourages a person to commit the substantive offence without being the principal offender. It's a fundamental principle of the criminal law that an accessory to a criminal offence can be tried, convicted and punished of an offence in the same way as the principal, even if it was not their hands who personally struck the blow, ransacked the house, smuggled the drugs or forged the cheque, where they encouraged or assisted those physical acts and had the necessary intention, the law says that it is right that they too are found guilty. Similarly, an accessory to a crime shares culpability precisely because they encouraged or assisted the offence. No one doubts that if the principal and the accessory are engaged together, for example, and this is an example that we heard earlier, on an armed robbery of a bank, the accessory who keeps guard outside is as guilty of the robbery as the principal who enters with a shotgun and extracts the money from the staff by threat of violence. Nor does anyone doubt that the same principle can apply where, as sometimes happens, the accessory is nowhere near the scene of the crime when it eventually transpires. The accessory who funded the bank robbery or provided the gun for the purpose is as guilty as those who are at the scene. Now, sometimes it may be impossible for the prosecution to prove whether a defendant was a principal or an, or an accessory, but that does not matter so long as it can prove that they participated in the crime either as one or as the other. That said, the threshold for anyone to be prosecuted and found guilty under the joint enterprise principle is very high. They must intend to assist or encourage the commission of the crime and therefore must know of the existing fact necessary to make it criminal. And if the crime requires the principal to have a particular intent, then the secondary must intend to assist or encourage the principal to act with that intent. With the greatest respect to the Honourable Gentleman, I, I'm not going to take interventions. There are other bills that need to be heard, and I think it's important that the government case is put. We've had a, a lengthy debate so far. Section 8 of the Accessories and Abettors Act 1861 provides that a secondary party can be prosecuted and punished in relation to the indict indictable offence as if they were the principal offender. This is the provision which the bill before us today seeks to amend. Until the judgment given in the case of the Crown versus Joji, the courts had identified three ways in which liability for an offence committed with others might arise. First, where two or more people join in committing a single crime in circumstances where they are, in effect, all joint principles. For example, where a group go on a shoplifting spree, taking goods out of shops without payment. In such a scenario, they are joint principles. Second, where a person encourages another to commit a single crime, again, such an example may involve a person providing another with a weapon so that they can use it in a robbery. The person providing the gun will be liable as an accomplice. 
And third, where two or more individuals participate together in a crime and in the course of committing that crime, let's say a robbery, one member of the group commits a second crime. For example, he shoots the security guard. The other members of the group may be prosecuted as accessories if they foresaw that that person with the gun was likely to use it. And this type of joint enterprise is known as par parasitic accessory liability. Now, parasitic accessory liability was crystallised in the case of the Crown versus Powell, a case involving two defendants who went to a drug dealer's home to buy cannabis, during which one of the defendants shot the drug dealer. Both were convicted of murder, as it was held that the other defendant had foreseen that the other party might use the gun and was therefore convicted as an accessory. This case adopted the reasoning set out in the case of the Crown and Chang Wing Su, a case involving three defendants who broke into a victim's flat, with one defendant stabbing the victim to death and wounding his wife. All three defendants were convicted of murder, which resulted in the principle that if two or more people set out to commit an offence, and in the course of it one of them commits another offence, the second person is as guilty as an accessory to the latter crime, even if he did not necessarily intend for the commission of that offence. It was enough that he foresaw it as a possibility, therefore establishing the precedent that a secondary party to a joint enterprise would be deemed to have intended to encourage or assist every one of the principal's offences. However, the case law moved away from this principle as a result of the Supreme Court decision in the Crown and Joji, as we heard earlier. Amin Joji was initially convicted of the principle of parasitic accessory liability for the murder of former Leicestershire police officer Paul Fife in, in 2011. The Crown Court at the time heard that Mr Joji had egged on his friend Mohammed, Mohammed Hersey, who stabbed Mr Fife in the heart. Mr Joji argued that he was not inside the house when the incident took place and could not have foreseen what his friend intended to do. He was convicted of murder and with a minimum custodial sentence of 20 years. Mr Joji appealed against his conviction for murder to the Court of Appeal, which follow, following which, in October 2015, he asked the Supreme Court to review the doctrine of joint enterprise and to hold that the court took a wrong turn in Chang Wing Su and the cases which followed it. Mr Joji argued that Chang Wing Su decision was based on a flawed reading of earlier authorities and questionable policy arguments. The respondents disputed those propositions and argued that even if the Supreme Court were persuaded that the courts took a wrong turn, it would be for the legislature to decide whether to change the existing law, since the law as laid down in Chang Wing Su had been in place for 30 years. The Supreme Court handed down its decision in Mr Joji's case in February 2016. Honourable, and in considering the case, I, I've already said to the Honourable Gentleman, I'm not... No, in... in point of order, Mary Chairman. What is going on? There's a, a, a feeling at the moment that junior ministers you know, will not get, take interventions. <coughs> That's against the whole spirit of a Friday open debate. What is the matter? All I want to know is, is he content with the, 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 the joint enterprise situation at the moment or not? Please, will he tell the House? Well, the point of order for the Chair is such that it is for the decision of the person on their feet as to whether they take an intervention or not. The Minister has decided not to. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. With the greatest respect to the Honourable Gentleman, I gave my reasons earlier, and it's not because I'm trying to curtail this debate, it's because there are other debates that I just take place afterwards. In answer to his substantive question, I'm outlining the Government's position on the position of joint um, enterprise. Now, in considering Mr Joji's case, the Supreme Court considered the issue of parasitic accessory liability, concluding that a person should not be guilty for merely foreseeing that an accomplice might commit a second offence during the course of the original planned crime. It considered that the law should revert to the well-established rule that exists in relation to other types of joint enterprise offending, that is, that a person can only be guilty of offences committed by other members of the group if he or she intentionally encouraged or assisted those offences to be committed. Where somebody participated in an offence which involved a clear risk of harm and, de and death resulted, though with no attention that it should happen, he or she could still be convicted of manslaughter. This led the Supreme Court to concluding that the law had taken a wrong turn 30 years ago earlier by creating foresight with the intent to assist. The correct approach was to treat foresight as evidence of intent to assist in the crime. Following this decision, Mr Joji was cleared of murder by the court but retried and found guilty of manslaughter, and his previous sentence of life imprisonment with a minimum of 20 years was replaced by a fixed term of 12 years. As a result of the decision reached in Joji, 
parasitic accessory liability no longer applies as a basis for criminal liability. However, this narrow change to the law on joint enterprise has been widely misunderstood as meaning that all convictions under joint enterprise would now be found not guilty on appeal. In circumstances where parasitic accessory liability previously applied, the principles applicable to all cases of secondary liability now apply. The decision in Joji effectively resolved what the government views as the most troubling aspect of the joint enterprise law. The government is aware that the ruling in Joji was initially welcomed by the academic world and families of convicted offenders, but this change in the law also appears to have been widely misinterpreted as applying to joint enterprise overall when the change is much more limited. That is, the change only relates to cases involving parasitic accessory liability. This has obviously led to defendants' families feeling further disappointment in the decision in Joji has had little or no impact on those serving time in prison for such crimes. But let me turn now to appeals. Appeals serve as an important corrective function for individuals, whether this is to correct a miscarriage of justice, such as the conviction of someone who is factually innocent, or to correct a legal error, such as imposing a harsher sentence than is legally permissible. They also serve important public functions in ensuring that the criminal law is interpreted and applied consistently and predictably. I know the substantive injustice test has been raised in the House in connection with joint enterprise previously, specifically whether the legislative change affects the validity of a conviction when brought under the previous law. This is an issue that is being considered by the Law Commission as part of their full and extensive review of the law in relation to criminal appeals and procedure. On the 27th of July 2023, the Law Commission published an issues paper seeking evidence on whether reform to the law on appeals in criminal cases, including the tests applied by the Court of Appeal and the Criminal Cases Review Commission, is necessary. This will help inform wider consultation paper on appeals law planned for publication later this year. The Law Commission intends to produce a final report with the recommendations in 2025, which the Government will be giving consideration to. I think it's also worth making the point that before anyone is charged with the crime, whether as part of a joint enterprise or not, the Crown Prosecution will only consider prosecuting if the case satisfies the full code test set out in the Code for Crown Prosecutors. And this, step, this test has two stages. The first is the requirement for evidential sufficiency and the second involves consideration of the public interest. At the evidential stage, a prosecutor must be satisfied that there is sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction. This means that an objective, impartial and reasonable jury or bench of magistrates or judge sitting alone, properly directed and acting in accordance with the law is more likely than not to convict. It is an objective test based on the prosecutor's assessment of the evidence including any information that he or she has about the defence. A case which does not pass the evidential stage must not proceed, no matter how serious or sensitive it may be. If the evidential stage is satisfied, the prosecutors must then go on to consider the second stage and whether a full prosecution is in the public interest. Now, having set out the background, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll move on to the bill before us today the purpose of which is to amend Section 8 of the Accessories and Abettors Act 1861. The amendment to Section 8 appears to propose that for a person to be tried, indicted and punished as a principal offender, they must aid, abet, counsel or procure the commission of an offence by making a significant contribution to the commission of an indictable offence. The Government notes that the declared purpose of the Bill is to better reflect a defendant's actual contribution to a crime where this is committed as part of a joint enterprise. We also note that the proposed change to Section 8 retains both its application to indictable only offences and its territorial extent, which is to say that the Bill proposes that any amendment to Section 8 will continue to apply in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Now, the Government is unable to support the Bill because it is technically flawed and the overall impacts of such a change will need very careful consideration. As I stated earlier, joint enterprise is an extremely complex area of law and Section 8 of the 1861 Act is intrinsically linked with other intra offences, such as those at sections 44 to 46 of the Serious Crime Act 2007. That is intentionally encouraging... I wish to drag you into the debate. I just want a point of order on a procedural clarification. And it is this. The Minister has said, and I quote, the Government is unable to support the Bill in its current form. It's not supportive of the Bill today. Um, 
it is procedurally correct, isn't it, that the government could allow second reading and then delay any committee proceedings until the consultation on the Law Commission's proposals, examination of the issue overall, could then be, amendments could then be brought forward. If it fails to do that, it's very difficult to see, unless the government is bringing forward, committing itself to bring forward legislation, whether or not there's an, a serious or imminent proposal to reform the law in this instance. I just wish to clarify that because there will be lots of people watching this debate who will be confused by the process we are going to. Yeah. The opportunity is still there for the government yeah. to allow a second reading and therefore bring forward a reform it may well wish to support at a later stage. Yeah. The case you just uh, stated is uh, correct procedurally, uh, but uh, after the Minister concludes I will go uh, back to Kim Johnson with the Leave of the House to see what the member in charge wishes to do. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, um, Section 8 of the 1861 Act is intrinsically linked with other intra offences, such as those at Sections 44 to 46 of the Serious Crime Act 2007. That is intentionally encouraging or assisting an offence, encouraging or assisting an offence believing it will be committed, and encouraging or assisting offences believing one or more will be committed. It is also linked with Section 44.1 of the Magistrates' Court Act 1980, which makes similar provision to that contained in Section 8 of the 1861 Act, but in relation to summary only or triable either way offences. Of key concern, however, is the proposed change to Section 8 that will place a requirement on the prosecution to identify the precise nature of a defendant's role in aiding, abetting, procuring or counselling the commission of the crime committed in order to pr prove that the defendant made a significant contribution a threshold which does not currently need to be met. This change could potentially lead to difficulties in securing a conviction and therefore bringing offenders to justice even where there is significant evidence that the defendants did participate in the crime simply due to evidential di difficulties in trying to establish the precise role that each party played. That is to say that they are a principal offender or an accessory and how much weight should be given to those roles in terms of their significant contribution which is not defined. It is also unclear whether this change was actually intended, as the Government believes the stated intention to the Bill is to clarify and not to amend the law of secondary liability. An additional concern is that no definition has been provided on what, what would be determined by significant contribution, and without such a definition, that would mean that a perpetrator's contribution to an offence could be determined differently, with bar being either lower or higher, depending on the assessment taken by the specific jury in question. In effect, there may be no real parity in assessment which could lead, in turn, to appeals on the basis of how a significant contribution to a crime could be assessed when compared with other such cases. This could result in an incoherent framework and would jeopardise the certainty of the law. So, for these reasons, Mr Deputy Speaker, conscious of time, um, in conclusion, I would like to thank again the Member for Liverpool Riverside for her bill. However, the government must oppose it for the reasons that I have outlined today. With the Leave of the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would just like to say thanks to everybody who has contributed to um, my debate today, and particularly to the parents in the gallery from Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association. I um, thank the Minister for putting forward the government's case. He did say not support today, so I'm taking that positively. I'm asking whether he would consider looking at reviewing that. And given that we are um, pushed for time and we have got um, other bills to be dated, um, debated today. I'm willing for the debate to be adjourned to another date. Yeah. Yeah. I beg to move this debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. As Madam say aye. 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 No, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Debate to be resumed what day? Friday, the 21st of June. Friday, the 21st of June. We now move to the next bill. Yeah.